Welcome to Montreal, Mr. Sadao. Thank you. I'd like to begin with some biographical questions. How did your association with uh, Buckminster Fuller begin? Uh, it began at uh, Cornell University in 1952. I was a student there, and uh, Cornell had a visiting uh, professor or visiting lecture program, and Bucky was a visiting lecturer or professor for that year, uh, in the last month of, of that year, actually, in 1952, and he conducted a, a project there, and that was my first exposure and first uh, meeting with Bucky. What, what stimulated your interest so much that uh, later on you worked on him? On, on well, what happened was the, the project that uh, we conducted there was a, uh, what's called a geosphere. It was a 20-foot representation of the Earth with the continental land masses uh, put on the surface of this 20-foot uh, sphere. And to do that, uh, uh, we had to take uh, maps or charts and then uh, blow them up and put them on, on, onto the sphere. And uh, I was in a topographic battalion in the uh, Corps of Engineers in the Army, so that uh, this sort of thing was very familiar to me, uh, whereas it was not with the other students. And so I naturally sort of did most of the work on it. And uh, what happened that year also was that uh, this was in May, and in June I went to uh, New York to work in our architectural office, and Bucky was also in New York at that time. And uh, during my free evening hours, I would work on a smaller version of the map, which we were going to reproduce and print. And uh, that kind of a uh, natural sort of, you know, association, working with them on my free, you know, with, in my free time, just sort of uh, developed into a kind of a gradual partnership afterwards. Is uh, the name of the map that was developed from, from your work on it was called uh, a Dymaxian Air Ocean World Map, oh. and the one that we the, the one that we actually produced was uh, called the uh, 1954 uh, NC State Edition because it was uh, actually uh, reproduced and uh, funded by North Carolina State University, the architectural school there. Uh, what was your principal role concerning the construction of the Montreal Geodesic Dome? Uh, the Montreal Dome, the uh, U.S. pavilion there in 1967, uh, I was Bucky's uh, partner at that time and uh, we joined up with another one of Bucky's firms called Geometrics Incorporated, which was located in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, it was this joint venture and I represented Fuller and Sadao, and so that I oversaw for Fuller and Sadao uh, uh, in a joint and equal basis, you know, all aspects of the uh, design and construction of that dome. All right. And uh, more specifically, uh, you were calling it, uh, or you would call it a uh, 16... Oh, 16 uh, frequency. 16 frequency. Yes, and the 16 frequency refers to the number of modular subdivisions on the edge of one of the uh, basic triangles. Uh, the geometry is based on a spherical icosahedron which is made up of 20 equilateral triangles. And what you do is you take, all of the edges are equal in the icosahedron. You take right. one of the basic edges, and the number of subdivisions you uh, use or break that down into is called the, the frequency. So a 16 frequency sphere? It's a 16 frequency geodesic grid on, on a sphere, yes. All right. Uh, was the dome the original idea for Expo 67? Uh, interestingly enough, no. The first uh, concept that uh, Bucky had was to actually use a uh, octet truss, which is a flat uh, space frame truss, uh, similar to what was actually used uh, later on in 1970 by the Japanese architect uh, Kenzo Tange. He used a large octet truss. Uh, what Bucky had in mind was that uh, this would be a very large uh, a roof and on the ground floor would be a large projection of the Dymaxion Air Ocean World Map, which would be computerized with, with display, you know, with these uh, bulbs. And there were a series of galleries up above that you would look down onto the map. And uh, up at the gallery would be a number of uh, consoles, which are computer consoles. And the idea was that you would be able to play uh, World Game, which is an, you know, another one of Bucky's ideas of where you try to sort of maximize the resources to make you know, as much of the resources go around for the benefit of all mankind rather than you know, for one particular sort of group. And so it was a very broad and sort of uh, interesting kind of an idea, but it just got too complicated and too difficult to, to uh, carry out that original idea. So 
that's when we decided to go with the uh, sphere, which was a, something that we were much more familiar with and uh, it was uh, much easier to actually realize than the original concept. Um, please explain uh, some basic principles. Uh, we hear of uh, synergy, uh, tensegrity, mm. um, but what do they mean? Well, well I, synergy, you know, uh, Bucky used that uh, first, I guess it must have been, uh, I don't know how many years ago it would be, but uh, it's, uh, it's used in chemistry, uh, chemistry a lot, apparently. It's, uh, it's a behavior of whole systems unpredicted by the behavior of any single component. Uh, and uh, it's uh, used to describe, you know, uh, total effects, you know, which are unexpected from analyzing just individual sort of, you know, components, such as the one of the examples that Bucky would often give was, you know, you have uh, H2O, which is water that, you know, you have two molecules of hydrogen and one of oxygen, and uh, out of these two gases, you get water, liquid, you know, and completely synergetic in terms of, you know, his sort of way of thinking about uh, things. And that this sort of phenomenon seems to sort of occur so often in life where what finally comes out is really much more than the result of uh, these two individual actions or two individual sort of elements. And so that it was uh, something that he used a lot and, and uh, would, uh, would, would sort of, you know, use to describe, you know, effects that uh, he was trying to produce. And what was the other word, synergy? And uh, tensegrity. tensegrity. Tensegrity comes from, uh, uh, Bucky coined that word, and he always used to sort of, uh, because so many of the things that he would sort of think about or produce uh, were so unusual that there was, not, there was no word, you know, that existed in the language to describe it completely. He would always be sort of creating or thinking of sort of new words. And tensegrity is one of those where it's a combination of tension and integrity. It's a structure which had tensile and integrity. Uh, where uh, ordinarily you have uh, structures where uh, compression, where you stack one thing on top of the other, that is the primary structural sort of, you know, uh, uh, force that's utilized to hold the building up. Whereas in Bucky's uh, way of thinking, he was always trying to get uh, more sort of uh, use out of, you know, uh, let's see, how should I put that? He was concerned about performance per pound, getting the most out of the least, you know, material. and. Uh, the tensile sort of quality of materials, you know, uh, was uh, was often much sort of superior to the compressive sort of properties, and he was trying to sort of uh, uh, utilize the tensile property more than the uh, co compressive. And the kind of structures that he did evolve, uh, which he called tensegrity, were uh, these structures or or mass, particularly where the compression element or struts were isolated from, in, from each other, but they were sort of woven into a tension network, but they, were, they had a structural integrity. So he called those the tension integrity structures or tensegrity structures. It's uh, difficult to sort of explain without having a model, but uh, oh, I hope you can follow what I'm trying to I, say. I guess uh, possibly uh, the Montreal geodesic dome is, it would be a model of this. Uh, uh, no, the, uh, uh, let's see, tensegrity, I don't think you would consider, you would call that really a tensegrity. It's, it's actually, uh, would uh, an octet truss then a projection? Well, it's, let's see. I think uh, let me look at the, think about the geometry. It's actually octahed. No, it's actually tetrahedral, sort of you know, joined face to face. Uh, uh, I think in the uh, geometry of the uh, Montreal dome, it's 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 a uh, it's a space frame which uh, is uh, kind of a hybrid. And it's not it's not it's not a tensegrity though in the in the sense that Bucky used the word. Right. When was the last time you visited the Montreal dome? Oh, that was, I think the last time was, I think, uh, when there was the opening ceremony, and I haven't been back uh, since then. 1967? Yes, that's right. So it's been a long time. Um, was the dome initially designed to be made of, um, I was going to say iron, but it's steel, I believe. Yes. Uh, not originally. Well, we looked at uh, several strategies, and uh, the two primary sort of materials we were thinking of were aluminum and steel. Aluminum because of its lightness and ease of uh, forming, and uh, steel for its economy. And uh, the aluminum one uh, did have certain attractive features about it, about you know, such as its lightweight and ease of uh, you know machining, forming, as I said. But when we tried to sort of design the joints, the kind of stresses that we had to carry were getting so massive and so huge 
that it became uh, very, very difficult to actually make an aluminum hub and mechanically fasten the strut and uh, hub system. So we ended up by going to the uh, steel welded system, which uh, you know was gave the most delicate and at the same time very strong, you know, stable structure. Uh, to your knowledge, is it the, the largest three-quarter sphere dome in the world? I think so, yes. There are larger span domes, uh, but uh, for its uh, height uh, and, uh, you know, that, uh, I don't know what the, what the best way to put it would be. It's, it's uh Around the presentation? Yeah, high, for, for, for height and diameter, I guess it is the, the largest in terms of the... Maybe now the one in, uh, in Long Beach, which houses the Spruce Goose, which is, I think, about over 400 feet in diameter, would, might be the largest now. And that is a three-quarters feet? No, that is a, about a one-third rise or a one-quarter rise. It's a very shallow rise dome. Um, after some research, I found that uh, one could fit the Pantheon from Rome inside the Montreal Dome. Mm -hmm. uh, going to Rome last year and mm -hmm. taking some measurements. Uh, I believe that the Montreal Geodesic Dome was the first large-scale environmental valve built. Um, what does that mean? Well, it, Bucky used to sort of, well, he would, he, in his way of thinking and an analyzing, you know, what shelter was, he would uh, sort of, he, he abstracted and tried to sort of uh, think of shelter as a kind of a scientific tool or an implement, I guess you would say. So he tried to sort of uh, uh, identify uh, what the function of shelter was and uh, what, was it, what was that uh, the, the actual word you I just used? I believe that the Montreal Judaism was the first large-scale environmental valve. Oh, environmental valve, yes. And so he would, he would consider uh, a shelter as a a valve or an instrument that would either permit or not permit, you know, various forces of nature to come through. So in other words, it was a valve in the sense that it kept the rain out, it kept the rain from coming in, or the wind, or the sunlight. But the sunlight you could control or valve by having blinds or shades so that, you know, when you, when you have the shade drawn, then uh, the light doesn't come in. When you open up the blinds, then the sun does come in. So it's that kind of a a, a device for controlling the forces of nature that you wanted to actually have come in or not. And that's, that's how the term environmental valve sort of, you know, comes up. Uh, I'm curious about, about the stresses on, on the structure mm -hmm. uh, of the geodesic dome, let's say, in Montreal, mm -hmm. the three-quarter sphere. Um, meaning putting pressure, um, applying pressure from the exterior mm -hmm. onto the, the, the struts or the surface, the exterior yes. surface, I believe, uh, that pressure would be equalized in all the elements of, of the dome until uh, maybe... No, I, mean, no, I wouldn't say it's equalized, it's just no. that uh, what happened is that the, uh, uh, when you apply a load at a particular point or, or a hub, then it, then, then it slowly you know, uh, gets dissipated or works itself you know, out into larger and larger sort of numbers of struts from that one initial point, but I don't think not necessarily equalized. Uh, would that uh, be also true for pressure being applied from within the dome yes. onto the exterior. I think it works e either way that what happens is that the load does get distributed over the total surface eventually right. from, you know, from vertex to vertex. So, so if one wanted to contain a certain atmosphere, mm -hmm. uh, let's say a, a great amount of hot air or uh, uh, certain gases, mm -hmm. or, or some, uh, do you think that would be workable? I think so. Actually, at a, a, yeah, at, a, uh, at a microscopic or at a smaller level, level, you have these, uh, uh, I don't know whether you call them animals or, or no, they're not animals, but you have what's what are called these radiolaria, which uh, uh, look uh, almost like geodesic domes in the way that nature actually sort of formed these very minute sort of, you know, creatures. Right. And uh, so that uh, they're floating in, a, uh, in the seawater, so it's, it's the pressure is equal all, all around, but uh, in the case of uh, what you're trying to describe here of having, you know, sort of forces on the inside, you know, sort of in, uh, you know, exactly. explosion or Im implosion, I think that, exactly. you know, it still does form this kind of a, a three-way grid, which is a very, you know, efficient way of sort of uh, containing and holding those kind of, you know, forces. Because I'm, I'm thinking, uh, what if we use such a structure, uh, not necessarily on a, uh, on, uh, in our environment, mm -hmm. let's say uh, uh, we transpose a three-quarter sphere on the moon, Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, 
and then we try to, to contain an atmosphere, mm -hmm. a livable atmosphere within that, mm -hmm. uh, taking into consideration the incredible temperature changes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think it would be a very, uh, you know, a logical sort of, you know, way of sort of structuring, you know, or, or designing a structure to uh, uh, solve this, just that kind of a question. So its ultimate application is, uh, is not necessarily earthbound. No, no, not necessarily, no, not at all. As we were seeing the state of the Montreal Geodesic Dome, now, this morning actually, do you believe it can be salvaged? Yes, I think it can. It's, uh, you know, looking at it, there are, uh, from what I could see anyway, only a few members were, you know, uh, distorted, but just being distorted, you know, I, th I think uh, there's enough redundancy in the design and in the structure that, that just those few members shouldn't affect the overall integrity, uh, so that I think, uh, you know, it can, it's perfectly safe just the way it is, I believe. And, uh, you know, thinking about it, I think that uh, maybe it should be kept more or less as a pure piece of sculpture rather than trying to put a roof or some membrane over it again, which then tries to put it back into some kind of utilitarian use and it sort of clouds or confuses the issue. And I think uh, it should be left just the way it is and then uh, completely separate from it, but still down at the lower levels then provide some other shelters, you know, that would uh, be uh, work work well with it. But uh, I think it's best to keep it in its pure form as just a structure and as sculpture, you might say. Have you been approached by any city or government officials regarding the eventual renovation of the dome, recently or up to a few years ago? Well, I think it was maybe four or five years ago. Uh, uh, is it Amark? Yes. Uh, an official from there uh, did contact us. And we did do a study where we were trying to uh, provide another enclosure, uh, which uh, would have been a fiberglass, uh, uh, a Teflon-coated fiberglass skin, similar to the kind of tent structures that are used now, you know, uh, on covering uh, these air-supported stadiums. But as I just said a little while ago, I think after being coming here and seeing it, I think it's much better just to leave the structure as it is and to do so whatever enclosure you have to do down low in discrete structures and not try to sort of uh, reproduce what we had before with the acrylic uh, and trying to have an overall enclosure. I think that would be wrong now. So you think, uh, uh, you feel that the foundations are still very sound? That there's just oh, I think so, yes. I think there's no, no question about that, that they are sound and that the uh, structure, you know, just the way it is right now, is, uh, will stand up for many, many more years. Did Buckminster Fuller write the final chapter? on dome structures or dome framework. If we go to the early Greco-Roman vaults, to the Byzantine and Renaissance domes, mm -hmm. to today, mm -hmm. uh, do you feel that he's kind of finished a chapter there where, where... Well, I think what he's done is he's, you know, brought to everyone's realization and, uh, and, and made people uh, more aware of the fact that, you know, large sp uh, scale enclosures are possible. I mean, until Bucky began this, I think, as you said, the Pantheon and some of the other structures, you know, were about, or the Dome in Florence were about the largest dome kind of structures, and they were usually all out of masonry. And uh, there were some of the radial rib arched uh, domes, but they were also fairly small in size. I think he expanded, you know, everyone's idea and concept and, uh, and uh, took away the fear of sort of, you know, going to larger and larger sort of enclosures. And, you know, uh, I don't think uh, what he's uh, done is, say, the, the last word. I think maybe the area now that uh, we might be going in is, is the uh, tensegrity, er the area of tensegrity, but th that requires a lot of work yet. And uh, I'm not prepared to say that is a solution, but I, I don't think uh, it's, it's uh, what, what Bucky's done up to now is the end. I think there's still, you know, lots of room for development. What do you feel is uh, Buckminster Fuller's greatest legacy? Do well, I think I partially mentioned the thing about, you know, sort of broadening man's vision about, you know, the possibility of enclosing, you know, larger and larger and larger space. That's right. one sort of a practical sort of, you might say, you know, but I think uh, uh, more in terms of philosophy and more in terms of, you know, his attitude toward uh, uh, making, you know, the resources of the earth, you know, work for all mankind rather than, you know, just for select sort of, you know, uh, groups. Uh, the idea of, of uh, the whole world, the whole world, you know, living, you know, in, in, a, in, in a sort of a, how should I say, 
I better maybe I better maybe maybe start this one over again. Okay. It gets into very uh, <clears throat> when, when when you start to explain Bucky's philosophy, then it becomes much more complicated and not and not e easy. What I mean by his legacy also, yeah. I don't yeah. just mean his realizations. Yeah, I mean the stimuli. Yeah, the I, I think it's uh, you know what, what he was talking about in terms of uh, of, of world man and of you know the world sort of you know uh, working together toward you know sort of a common goal, common you know sort of a and, and where. It, it doesn't have to be where it's uh, you or me in the, in the sense of either you survive or I survive, but you know, of both surviving and of both working, you know, that there's this idea that there is enough to go around for everyone to sort of enjoy a standard of living that's higher than what's ever been experienced up to, up to now. Uh, it's, it's those ideas, I think, you know, which will in the end, uh, I think, uh, remain, you know, and sort of, you know, Put, put Bucky historically, you know, in place. perspective and place, yes, I think. Are there any dome projects in preparation now? Um, is it still used as a viable realization? Yes, uh, very much so. Uh, I myself am working on one in Malaysia, which is a multi-use uh, structure. It's uh, 140 feet in diameter, and it's in uh, Penang. And we have an associate there, uh, Lim Chong Kit, whose uh, firm, uh, team architects team three, are the architects for this for this uh, project. Uh, also, one of Bucky's uh, former students, uh, Don Richter, is with a firm called Temcor, and they are actually uh, in the dome business. They manufacture domes. They, uh, they were the ones who put up the stainless steel dome over the South Pole down at Antarctica, about a 300-foot-plus diameter dome. They are also the firm that uh, designed and constructed the 400 and I forgot how many feet diameter spruce goose stone the dome that encloses the, uh, the uh, seaplane that Howard Hughes designed. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and let's see, what else? Uh, and they put up all sorts of other sort of domes for various, various uses, for gymnasium, for, uh, I think it's been used as a bank, it's been used as a uh, church. Uh, uh, and then there are also other firms, that, they're the ones who make a lot of aluminum. They make fairly large span, uh, I mean, uh, large diameter domes. Then there are smaller firms in California which make uh, single-family dwelling units, individual homes, maybe 36, 48 feet in diameter. Uh, there's a firm called uh, Cathedralite, the Monterey Domes. Those are two that uh, I know of who are the most successful, but I'm sure there are other firms do, you know, doing similar kind of structures. So there are domes in existence in oh, the day-to-day mm -hmm. -day Yes. That's very interesting. Many projects in Canada are being undertaken now to construct roofs for various sports stadiums. Mm -hmm. um, would not the dynamics of the geodesic dome have ideal qualifications for such construction? I think so. Uh, I think uh, that the, uh, the, let's see, how should I put this? What's come into sort of more use, you know, uh, in recently are these uh, tensile structures, you know, not tensile, but uh, air inflated structures. Uh, but they have been having problems, uh, you know, with uh, fabric, fabric sort of ripping and the uh, structures coming down in, in, in uh, heavy wind or heavy snow. And uh, I think the cost originally was uh, fairly, uh, well, cheaper than, you know, normal rigid structures, but I think the costs are not getting to the point where uh, these uh, air inflated or tensile structures are getting as expensive or more expensive than rigid, than rigid enclosures. And I think that. Uh, uh, soon, I think you will be seeing very large diameter geodesic type domes, you know, being built just as much as your uh, tensile structures. Have you been approached by any, any people in that sort of construction area? Uh, well, we did, uh, we were going to be doing something in Japan, but it didn't come through, but uh, 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 not too many uh, uh, inquiries yet. How does it feel to, what is it, 16 years later, mm -hmm. to... Uh, to see the, um, well, yes, your realization. Uh, well, yeah, it's, uh, that you I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, how does it feel? 
It feels, I feel very good that, you know, we were able to do such a structure at that time. You know, I think it still feels good and I think it's still a fabulous structure, you know, and I feel still very proud to have been part of that kind of a, you know, project. Some people compare it to the Eiffel Tower and the Crystal Palace. I think it has that similar kind of significance for Montreal, you know, and uh, I, th I think it should, should be kept and, you know, sort of uh, uh, protected and uh, put to some use and not just left there as a kind of a derelict structure because a derelict structure just attracts more vandalism and more destruction. I think it should be uh, honored and appreciated and something should be done about it. Thank you so much, Mr. Sadao, for coming to Montreal. Yeah.